Welcome to the Touching Into Presence podcast. This podcast is for people who are interested in body work, empowerment, and somatic based practices. I am Nikki Olson. I'm Andrew Rosenstock. We are certified Rolfers. Collectively, we're trained in various movement and bodywork therapies with an emphasis on somatic awareness and client resilience. Through conversations, our goal is to share and explore mind-body paradigms to offer empowerment possibilities. It was such a pleasure to be in conversation today with Michael Shea. Michael is one of the preeminent educators and authors in the fields of somatic psychology, myofascial release, and cranial psychotherapy. He leads seminars throughout the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Michael received his master's degree in Buddhist psychology at Naropa University and a doctorate in somatic psychology at the Union Institute. In 1986, he was certified as one of the first full instructors of cranial psychotherapy by the Upledger Institute. Michael has been a Florida licensed massage therapist since 1976 and was an advanced rolfer for 20 years. He's a founding member of the International Affiliation of Biodynamic Trainings and the Massage Therapy Body of Knowledge Task Force. Michael brings a unique cross-cultural perspective to teaching health and healing with a teaching style grounded in a spiritual practice of developing compassion with the use of manual therapy. In today's conversation, we spoke about body shame, myths, and outdatedness of BMI, contemplative practice of eating, interoceptive awareness and its importance, repairing relationships, sovereignty, and a ton more. It's always great to be in conversation with Michael, and we hear from so many of you out there how much you enjoy these talks. Just a reminder, you can also buy the book we talk about from Michael, The Biodynamics of the Immune System, Balancing the Energies of the Body with the Cosmos, and the links in our talk are at any bookstore of your choice. So with that, let's begin our talk. Hey, Michael. Hey, how you doing, Nikki? Howdy. Hey, Andrew, how you doing? Hey, Michael, how you doing? Well, it's funny, I thought I'd be the, Nikki, you said you might be later. I thought I would be like earlier and I'm the last one here. Yeah. Everyone's just, Everyone's so excited to be here. I am. I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah, so am I. I was reading your book, which I love. Uh, and um, one of my clients says, one of my clients, uh, I'll give her a shout out. Hi, Anne, because she has been really listening. She's been loving the podcast, but she really loves your talks. And I told her, and she just bought your book. But when I told her about how uh, we we're going to maybe talk about body shaming, she she loved it. And um and I think it's an important thing. But when I was reading your book, Michael, it was like, to some extent, it was like reading my own autobiography. There were numerous parts in your book where I was like, wow, I'm, the, 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 the similarities. I, I had no idea, first of all, that you're six foot four, because we see you pretty much from, uh, right. like, you know, head up. And when, when, I, when I heard that, I said, oh, well, you know, because I'm six four as well. And I was also very heavy when I was younger. So I really appreciated what you wrote, not just um, not just because of what you wrote, but also the the having been through similar experiences, and then also thinking about other people who are going to be getting that and and going through. And, and I think it is a very important topic, so I'm I'm excited to to be in conversation today. Good, good. Yeah, and I, I know the the past. I when I finally realized how overweight I was after I got out of the service, and I was telling my mother, I said, you know, because I was looking at the stats, and I said. Mom, um, you, you you never have ever mentioned in my whole life that I you know might be overweight or whatever, and and I said it turns out I'm I'm like almost a hundred pounds over over the norm, and she looks at me she says, but you carry it so well because of your height, and I went oh thank you, <laughs> yeah yeah similar I had that thing because I am so my wife's five one and I'm six four, I mean, she'll say like if you if I gain a kilo. You know, it doesn't show, whereas if she does, it, it does. So she goes, oh, you can put on more weight because you're yeah. tall. And and I think that to some extent, sure, but to some extent, no, if I'm carrying a lot of extra weight, I, I don't and I don't always notice it. You know, um, it, it can it can add up. And then it's like a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. I mean, that's what happened to me when I was younger, partly was it was like a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. And I, I was I think similar to you, I was eating away my frustration. You know, I was eating away my anxiety. It was a, it was a coping mechanism, and I didn't quite realize it until it was until I was also a hundred pounds overweight. And and yeah, so I, I might have been able to carry it better than someone five six. Well, I think this is interesting, just leading into it. And I was trying to 
find it quickly, but I feel like I saw something kind of on, I don't know, one of my news feeders about how the BMI is being reconsidered because of, um, and I think maybe a little bit, kind of lessening the emphasis of like, you know, underweight, perfect weight, overweight, and and kind of speaking to that different bodies and different structures hold weight differently and how, is, is this the best way to kind of categorize and identify where someone is on the spectrum of their weight. So well, I think there's something to be said to that. Well, you know, in my book, that's that's a really good point, Nikki, because um, there's two points there. And uh, in my book, basically, because I, I have followed this literature forever on obesity and, and well, not forever, but long enough. BMI is very um, challenging. Uh, some of the research... And I can say within the last six months this year, BMI is officially not medically recommended to be used as an indicator anymore. All right. Now, what they what they're preferring as an indicator is called waist hip ratio. So you just make a measurement of your waist and the measurement around the heads of your femur. And I, I you can go online for what that ratio is supposed to be. You know, but once again, it's just like your point, which is really well taken. There's different body types, you know, and so there's going to be different dynamics associated with that. And that's the history of of like Wilhelm Reich's work um, and Reichian therapy that's come down through, you know, the Rolf Institute, because that was that was part of the early uh, dynamic within Rolfing was Reichian therapy based on the six uh, character types, six body types. And before that, you had constitutional psychology, Sheldon's work in World War II, the three basic body types. <clears throat> and my point here, and I'm trying to make with the book, is that we're at a point now where there's really only one body type. It's the metabolic body type. And what that means is that if you really want to find out if you have a challenge with your weight, you have to find out how much abdominal visceral fat you have around your organs and how much visceral fat you have around your heart. So in a recent study at, at um, the National Science Foundation, 6,000 person cohort, 6,000 people cohort, and they did MRI studies of their visceral fat. And, and they found that that's really the best way to find out because even skinny people can have um, a lot of visceral fat and have a metabolic problem uh, with the fat not being overweight. So the weight thing is kind of a, what do they call that? A red herring. We're trying to find words to describe it. But the point being, um, it also involves knowing, you know, your, your inner body and knowing your type. Um, so, and if you can afford to get an MRI study of your, your abdomen, uh, that's going to be one of the best ways to find out just, you know, how much you are carrying. But the issue is, how do you get rid of it? And how do you manage the damage that it's done psychologically to you individually, what you've carried around your life? So it's not the weight so much. Yeah, the weight's a problem metabolically. Um, and the outcomes for that aren't really good. Type 2 diabetes, cancer. Um, all sorts of things from from uh, being overweight. But it's really the psychodynamics, I think, that are more interesting to me. I've lost the weight. I lost the weight a long time ago. And I'm still dealing with the psychological, you know, profile, the, the, the psychodynamics of it. So I find that fascinating. Totally. Can we unpack that a little bit of what what is what still <clears throat> maybe speaking for, you know, using yourself an example or maybe people you've met? Because where it's, I think it's interesting to have this conversation because we're kind of speaking from the lens of being overweight and still, you know, but you've lost the weight and where are you, how are you identifying with that? Where there's like on the other end of the spectrum with people who have the other end of the eating disorder of, you know, malnourished and not eating enough and then constantly they're having image or thoughts of that they're carrying extra weight. So I just, I think it's 
typically when people lose weight, they're like high on life and they're really excited about their new, their new structure per se. (laughs) Here's the thing psychologically for me, when I lost the weight and I lost it through a, a variety of means and one of which was anorexia and bulimia. Um, which went on for like three years before I, I went into the Rolf Institute. But since then, I've, I've had more sanity around how I manage my weight. But the, the dynamic of feeling that I finally had control of my body, I finally had control of what I was putting in my mouth, and, and I was able to control my weight. And the, the, that notion of control is a, a slippery slope. Um, and a lot of people have given away control of their body, but when you really take back control of your body, it's, it's powerful. It is to feel that I had lost the weight and I knew how to control the weight, but not the psychology. I didn't know that part yet or the spiritual component associated with it, but just that, that the psychodynamics of control is stunning that, that I could actually not have the knife and fork and spoon go in near my mouth for periods of time uh, and and could lose weight that way. Michael, did you also, this is from my own experience, stuff I noticed with that was like going to eat and then recognizing that was, it was, I didn't need it. It was a habit. It was a pattern. And then kind of like either, or even like taking a bite of something, I, I would do this. I would sort of take a bite of something and then realize like it would kick on later. Like I don't actually need this. And spit it up because I was like, I, this is that the old habit was to eat, to, to numb or to fill a space. Um, And then as I would start to recognize that later to, to cross cancel it in a way and say, okay, wait, you know, and, and at first what I would do would kind of beat myself up. I'd kind of get upset because I was doing what I shouldn't, but later I learned that, or I'm just learning. So like, okay, uh, (laughs) I've done this thing. I forgot, or I, you know, you know, I had to have it ingrained in either my body, my psychology, my spirit somewhere in there. And I need to now, um, you know, I'm, I'm working to, un- to, to resolve that. And so I don't know if you had similar experiences like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, there's, uh, you know, when I sit down for a main meal with my wife, you know, and I put that first fork full of food in my mouth and I go, you're not hungry. Why are you eating? Why are you even putting this in your mouth? Um, and but but in my twenties, I would I would do that, and I would forcefully you know go into the bathroom and actually you know throw up the food in, into the into the toilet. But and and that was a, a significant bulimia, and I actually had to outgrow that as well. And it's like, well, wait a minute, that's <laughs> that's not really a, a socially acceptable way to deal with being out, you know, in mixed company at a restaurant or something, excuse me, I got to go to the bathroom and they don't know why I'm going to the bathroom. But at any rate, I I think that's, these are the subtleties of the weight issue. You know, you get the food in the mouth and all of a sudden you you go, wait a minute, do I need this? Why am I, am I really hungry? And even now, you know, I, I know I'm hungry. I'll sit down and eat and then I'll go, oh my God, it's going to be over in 10 minutes. There won't be enough. So then it's the other end of the spectrum. There won't be enough, you know? It's, so it's it's the subtleties of the, the mental dynamic around food and weight that that are, it's a constant meditation. It's a contemplative practice, actually, to come into relationship with it and to self-regulate and not take it personal, so to speak. Well, it's interesting. There was a there was a part part in there that I wanted to almost joke about to say, of course, that's your Irish, um, your Irish roots. Um, but then it's it's not just the Irish roots. I grew up uh, Jewish and Jewish culture, and there was a sense of you know, you, are, would there be food? Because culturally, there, there was a point where we were slaved and trapped. And my wife is Chinese. <laughs> During the Cultural Revolution, there wasn't enough food, and I find it really interesting. So me and my wife are both coming out of her a little bit different, me a little closer to it. Periods where our our grandparents or our parents, well, it was really our grandparents were in periods where there was no food. So our parents were taught to eat every last bite of food. And that's pushed upon us. You know, the old saying, which interestingly is in both China and America, of people are starving in Africa. Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that old, that old thing. Um, and so that's pushed upon us culturally that becomes part of the psychology as well of like, Oh, I need to, I need, even though I'm full, I need to eat because 
essentially our grandparents didn't have that. And therefore how that's all tied in, I find it fascinating. Well, that's a really good point. Uh, Kate Shanahan, who I like to follow, uh, her book on deep uh, nutrition is just a fabulous book. Um, on It's called Ancestral, her, The Four Principles of Ancestral Nutrition. And she's got a new book out. And I was looking at it um, uh, last month, and it really makes a lot of sense. And her point is that, and this is around the obesity and the weight issue, is that in exactly what you're talking about, Andrew, we have a genetic imprint from hundreds of thousands of years, and that genetic imprint is called feast or famine. And consequently, the way we choose, you know, our, our nutrition and all that is based on when there's a lot of it around, let's feast and, and even get overweight because we're going to go through a period of famine and we're going to lose the weight. And her point is that that's so programmed into us, but unfortunately or unfortunately, however you want to you know, look at this, in our contemporary society, there's nothing but feast, nothing but feast. There, there's rarely an opportunity unless you volunteer to intermittently fast. And, and I did 40-day water fast, 60-day water fast. I had to break the cycle of the feast, the feast, the feast, always the feast. So I was able to break the cycle of the feast. And now I understand that. I really understand how deep that is at, a, at that transgenerational um, dynamic that you're talking about. All of us. I know what's your background, Nikki. Well, I'm just sitting here, you know, feeling very honored that I get to have this conversation with you and with both of you. And also, I, you know, I, I recognize, I feel lucky too that like, and so here I'm speaking to two men who are identifying with, you know, some kind of eating disorder and I don't have one. I've never had an issue around food. I think there's a little bit, a little bit of like growing up, I was just naturally skinny for a long time. And I'm saying this not to say that I don't, um, you know, I've, I've, especially after having kids, I'm carrying a little extra weight and, and especially when I was pregnant, like I had, I carried big babies and I got big. And so the, but I, I felt the society and luckily I didn't like internalize it too much. But I felt this idea, like judging me on, on my my shape a little bit, and um, and I have lots of friends who've had some sort of eating disorder, and and it really occupied a big part of their their life, and to some degree, still well into their adult life. You know, it's my friends that are 40, 50 years old. So, um, and like I joke in some ways that I couldn't, I couldn't ever starve myself because I faint really easily if I am not, if I don't have proper nutrition. Um, so, so yeah, I'm just kind of sitting here processing, but what, what Michael, what you were just talking about with like the feast. So I've always grocery shopped and my partner, my husband's similar when we want, when we need food, we'll just go to the grocery store and get whatever meal, whatever we're preparing for. And, but since the pandemic, I got a, you know, first time getting a membership to Costco and just this recently, I'm, we're sitting with so much extra food and things that was like overbought. And now I'm yeah. kind of thinking yeah. about like, you know, how, how we can, you know, a lot of grocery shopping is about abundance and surplus. And I just purged our pantries and things because a lot of things are kind of getting close to their expiration but i was just like wow we have so much yep. that we don't need yep and so i ended up donating it to our local food pantry but as i was going through it i was just kind of in the process of like wow this is how a lot of people's pantries look like it's just like stock full of stuff and it's like and it's all like things that have long shelves. It's not live food, right? It's like, you know, I'm sitting on this, some of this is a couple years old and I'm getting rid of it because it's about to expire, but we've had it for years. 
And so, yeah, that I think the way we have fueled ourselves has also become quite problematic in dealing with this, you know, mixed variables of food is becoming less and less live food. And it's like our bodies aren't really digesting it that well. And then the whole feast thing of like, oh, it's here. And I'm thinking about the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, when there's so much food and everybody's just so stuffed and like, <laughs> you know, but they're, it's there. So they're eating it and it's there. And it's, you know, that it's just, it's this vicious cycle that we're in. And I really I think it's important conversation of coming to the freedom of like the embodiment that we kind of need to cultivate because we've lost it of the freedom that we have around choices with food. And we work on this with our kids. Like my husband grew up with like, you know, finish the plate club. And I challenged that a little bit because I was forced to say, again, I was surprised I didn't get an eating disorder because I had to spend some summers um, with relatives and they made me finish my plate and I was full and I couldn't eat anymore. So I would go take it to the bathroom and throw it away. I wasn't purging. I didn't have to have that full on throw up experience. Um, I hate throwing up, so I'll do anything I possibly I'll get on my hands and knees and pray <laughs> before I <laughs> voluntarily throw up. And so, um, but yeah, it's just, it's so wild of all the different imprints that we get as we're growing up. And so I'm very clear with my kids, like if you're full, you don't have to finish, but it doesn't mean you, you, you don't get dessert. <laughs> if you don't ah, finish, you're like your ah, nutritionist food, <laughs> but you don't have to finish everything. Right. And yeah, I think it's, so it's helped because the kids do know like when to stop. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, you know, that theme really, one of the themes with being overweight is body image. You know, what did we learn from our parents and under underneath the overweight or the weight issue is that when we were little ones, We, the way we learn to be with our bodies is, and we created a body image based on the observation of our mom and dad. And, and we would actually imitate their bodies. And, and my mother was skinny as a rail. um, And then my father carried a little bit of overweight. So, you know, but the body image stuff is also associated with the programming we have that you're describing, you know, you know, the starving people in China. I think that's the one I got, the starving people in China thing and, and always eating. And let me tell you, we my mother cranked it out. Um, she really cranked out, a, you know, a lot of food. So it was, it was great that way. But some of that programming, you know, it's great. You have to overcome it. And it's that simple. You tell your kids you don't have to eat it all. And the challenge right now is that That's called interoceptive awareness in the research literature, okay? And I've got a new book that I'm writing, and so it's going to be a lot about that interoceptive awareness. Consciously knowing uh, the the four principles of interoceptive awareness, feeling your heartbeat consciously, feeling when you're hungry consciously, and that's, that's in my current book, in all the different ways that we might feel that we're hungry. But that also means feeling when you're full. And if you're telling someone to overeat when you're a kid, you're you're suppressing their intrinsic self-healing capacity to know when they're full. Yes. Amen. So, yes. And when you do that, you know, you take away control of their body because an outside authority is saying, no, you're not full. You got to eat more. So that means you're just going to cascade into outside authorities telling you what your body is, what it needs, you know, what drugs, what everything. And you gradually, as we grow up, we we seed this authority away from our body. And so much of it is around the food. And then you get into the processed food issue. And that's that's huge. Also, we could we could spin off on that. But the interoceptive awareness of knowing when you're hungry knowing when you're full, but also the drainage pathways have to be open as well. You have to know when you have the urge to go to the bathroom to either defecate or urinate. 
And so many people suppress that urge because they don't know when they're full. They don't know when they're hungry and they might get a signal to go to the bathroom, but they ignore it. So, so there's all this inner body confusion and it leads to, for some of us, obesity and overweightness. So it's, it's a whole plethora of dynamics, but it has to do with control and interoceptive awareness knowing the signals consciously on the inside of our body. I never got that. <laughs> I never got that. I'm still working on it right now. And I'm 75, you know, really tuning into how do I know when I'm hungry and how do I know when I'm full? That's, that's how we started, Andrew. You know, like you mm -hmm. get that first, I sit down for dinner with my wife and I go, Oh God, I'm not really hungry. You know, can I really, you know, get this down? So yeah. Really you know my my wife is very into having three regular meals a day and i'm i'm into like why don't we eat when we're hungry and i've it, it's a battle i've learned to give up on um as as you both know being married you have to give up on numerous battles that's one i've sort of given up on but the problem is that what i should do is just eat a little bit but as soon as there's food there my programming is like eat and my wife cooks nice food. So then I end up eating more. And that's, that, that's not on her. That's on me to, if I'm going to play a part of that, that I have to just sort of eat less and eat less, but it's, um, it, it's really more about listening. I, I really liked a lot of what you were saying there. Um, and, and actually Nikki, there's something you hit upon that I want to touch on, which is, and it was one of the things I was actually hesitant about having this talk is that, as you mentioned, uh, Michael and I are men and usually the, more of the body images and the body shaming goes to the woman. And so there was a part of me that says, oh, okay, well, we're, we're men, isn't it? And you know, well, people think, oh, a typical men taking over the conversation again. But I think there's there's another part that while women generally get the brunt of it and it's more publicized, that actually men uh, aren't really allowed, like we're allowed to be heavier societally than, than, than women because we're not judged as much. But I think there's a lot more inner silent stuff going on on about what is it like to be heavy that isn't talked about. Uh, and so one of the things I was hoping is that some of the conversation will um, shine a light on something that maybe isn't as shown. And now granted, <laughs> men still have it, I think, generally better. So I don't want it to be like, you know, the the 5% speaking up and saying, hey, what about us? But that it is, it is a real thing. And that ultimately, whether you're a man or a woman, shame is shame. And, and whatever you're carrying is is there. And to some extent, trying to get over, um, well, men have this and women have that. And just like human has this, human has has that. And that's, uh, you know, I appreciate you commenting on that before, Nikki. Well, yeah, I 100% I agree that shame is shame. And and I do think, I and I, I feel like men, and I think this is an important conversation. I don't feel like it is taking away, you know, the men, you know, claiming the space of, of eating disorders, but um, because we can say it how it is. Women are, their value a lot of times is more about how they look and how, what their frame is and this and that. But it's not to say that men have their own stuff as well. And for being in the fitness industry for quite some time, I know a fair amount of men that, you know, have had very bizarre eating patterns, eating behaviors that, um, that they almost, that, that, yeah, it wasn't healthy. And so, but it was like, I guess like maybe a little bit more norm, but, um, but I think it's just for who, whatever gender you are or how you identify, I think what Michael really spoke about is coming Coming back to like really being, and we're using this around food, but I think it can be applied to so many things of kind of tapping into the internal messagings and to honor that and not to override that. And which we identified as interoception. And I think that's, I mean, that's so key. I mean, I think it's key in terms of we want to talk about consent or what are we watching? What media stuff is being thrown into our face? I mean, while technology has been amazing and revolutionary in so many ways, I think as the human race, we also, we have to kind of reclaim our, our natural senses. 
Well, that's well said, um, because, you know, I agree with you, you know, with the social media and the television, we're actually feeding our brain garbage, just like, you know, eating processed food in our stomach. So and, and, and that's the point that our senses, our five senses, our exteroceptors are in a state of overwhelm because of the messaging that's coming through from society, whether it's fat shaming um, and all. I mean, if you watch any tell, I don't watch a lot of tell. I actually watch almost nothing. But when I do, the advertisements are very telling, you know, in terms of how they're shaming certain aspects or, or parts of the culture and so forth. And you have to turn down the exteroceptors. You, you've got to reduce that. From a meditative point of view, you've got to stop labeling what you're seeing. You've got to stop labeling what you're hearing. You've got to reduce the amount of screen time and all that in, because it's out of balance with interoceptive awareness because you, we have to nurture that that inner awareness. I got asked uh, when I was in uh, Switzerland in, in, in March. I get asked to do an interview uh, for a documentary film on cancer. And I said, you know, I don't really know a lot about cancer. I teach at a cancer clinic in Switzerland, so I know a little bit. Um, but I don't treat clients with cancer. I mean, they come into my, my practice every now and then. And I, I, I was thinking about it. And I said, yeah, I, I'd be happy to do that. Because when you get a cancer diagnosis, what I notice is, there's a state of fear. There's a state of terror that people go into. You get that diagnosis and bingo, you have to turn inward. And that turning inward, you've got to confront your fear and terror. And we have a culture that doesn't know how to turn inward because there's no interoceptive awareness. They, they've given up control to outside. And I really think that part of our work is helping people turn inside but they have to also voluntarily to reduce the amount of sugar and processed food. But as you say, they've got to reduce the, the screen time, the, the messaging that's coming in because it's there's subliminal shaming happening all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to get into it. I, we could get into that a lot. But the shaming issue is important because I got called fat. So, you know, a million times and you just get oh, used oh, to yeah. being called fat. So. I mean, I, re I remember, I still remember, I was probably in second grade and um, uh, one of the cooler kids, we had the same hat and he was like, he saw me with it and he took, he looked at me and took it off because I was a fat kid. And I like, remember the, I still remember the visceral feeling of, of, of the shame in, you know, in there. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the shaming issue. And, and I think that's, you know, part of human nature. Also, I, I don't know why people have to shame one another, but um, and we, it makes it because it makes it generally makes people feel better. If my theory is that people when people are insecure, they they, they look for something else to make them feel better, to feel higher up. And so if you right. find something that you can pick on, it gives you a sense of, well, at least I'm not there. Right. Um, and it's it's a horrendous it's a horrendous thing it's it's uh, it's a it's a relatively I don't know if it's a normal thing or if it's a if it's something that we've just learned over time and it's become the norm but I think that once you recognize it because uh, you said we all can do it but once we recognize it once we have the, the the inner awareness of oh I'm doing this thing and I don't need to or even oh I'm I'm insulting you because I'm insecure we can switch it around and sort of say, oh, all right, uh, thank you. Like, thanks for pointing out how insecure I am. Like, and I, you know, and the whole sense of compassion of like, you're struggling, however you're struggling. The, the more I can raise you up, the more it raises me up, it raises you up. But we tend to go the other way and just say, hey, stupid. <laughs> and I'm guilty of that too. I mean, I'm, I'm right. far from perfect in that way. Right. <laughs> it, you know, a lot of this begins in the home and I, I mean, I don't have kids, so maybe Nikki, you know, you can talk about it because I but I hear constantly, um, you know, the shaming issue actually begins in the home in between kids and kids do that and teenagers do that. But if the parents are doing it and if the parents don't try to stop the kids from doing it to each other, they don't know how much damage is happening, long term psychological damage around body image, 
from the fat shaming or whatever the shaming issue is that's going on. It might not necessarily be about weight. So do you see that with your kids, Nikki? I mean, well, it's interesting that we're talking about this first. I feel like just the way I would identify shame, because I think shame can be brought on by somebody else, like from a bullying behavior, or we can have our own personal shame by how we feel like we, how we stack up around our peers or the environment or whoever we're, you know, whoever we're around. Cause I think shame doesn't always have to be done onto you. You can kind of create your own shame. And so something, and and so I'm thinking about this because um, a couple of weekends ago where we had friends over, my husband was making pizza and it's an abundance and everybody's like, it's gorgeous pizza. It's all fresh made, but it's a ton of it's coming out. And so people are kind of getting, they were in the, the feasting, fun feast. And I don't know, somehow it came up with my son because everybody's like talking how full they were. And my youngest was a huge fat baby. Also his weight, the appearance of weight, he had a kidney disease. So one of his kidneys was multi, like had a bunch of cysts. So his belly was just huge and but but he was delicious. I mean, such a gorgeous fat baby. But, and he's heard this growing up and it's always been more endearing, but this particular weekend, something switched and I, I caught it. And now I'm, I'm going to make sure I don't talk about, you know, but basically he was like, there was, I, I could tell that his, his enjoyment of being identified as a fat baby was no longer there. Uh-huh. And something and he's six. So, but basically something, he kind of like got angry with me. He's like, you're fat too. <laughs> <laughs> and the way I was like, it stung a little bit. And I was like, you know what? Sometimes mom is feeling a little fat. So I just tried to normalize it and not, and not like, you know, a, we had a bunch of people around, but I have been thinking about it of, you know, being more careful, like now he is probably coming of an age where he's, a, you know, recognizing who he is and who he is amongst his, you know, young people, his friends and stuff. And, you know, and I'm in Boulder, so everybody, it's constantly yeah. talked about how, you know, while a lot of Boulder looks great from the you know, outside lens, I think I've said this before, I don't remember where but on this podcast, but There's a a New York Times popular publication occasionally. Well, it's a repeat story because it's happened a couple of times where Boulder people are. It's like Boulder people are best looking naked and worst looking dressed, saying that we look good, athletic and stuff, but we have a terrible sense of style. (laughs) (laughs) So, um but I mean, but it's, there is some truth. I mean, it's a very active community and people can get very righteous about how they eat and what they're doing and what fat is like producing what athletic benefit and blah, blah, blah. So, um, so yeah, um, coming to the, the, the shame. It just, I, I don't, it's, it's very fascinating. And I'm seeing it with some of my, um, young people, young women in my family who are dressing according to a trend, which is very, you know, very little midriffs, teeny tiny shorts. And, um, and they're coming into more of a womanly body. And I, I don't see that they are necessarily comfortable. They may, I, but I, can't, I think it comes back to those, their body is responding to some internal messaging because they're like, you know, while they have clothes that are not really covering much, they're all, but then they're using their own body to cover. They're slouchy or like constantly like adjusting their shorts or like, you know, pulling on the little bit of clothing they have to kind of cover what they're doing. And I, and I see this, you know, not in just my own family, but I see it in you know being out and about you know like I said I have young kids and so the elementary age some of the middle school kids it just it's it's back to like how do we come back to honoring who we are 
and what feels safe and good and not so much of what the influences are from our society and a lot of like clothing trend you know well and i i think some of those kids also i mean i don't know you know but i'm i'm sure like some of the dads when they see their their daughters you know with skimpy clothing on you know might get critical of the skimpy clothing but i don't know but what i would recommend or say to you did you do a repair with your son during after that episode did you say look i realized you've outgrown and it's not right to even mention the word fat around you anymore because you're not that. And, and I'll make an agreement not to, to even bring that up again and let him know how inappropriate, you know, it is to even have pursued that after a certain amount of time. You know, I, I, I haven't, not to that. Nope. Um, I mean, it's something, it's something to consider because, and again, because he had a reaction, you know, and and so it got into that the name calling. But the the shaming is a very interesting dynamic because it's on a spectrum of embarrassment and mm-hmm. self consciousness. We are supposed to be embarrassed by our actions sometimes, and when and it's a natural embarrassment. And when we feel that embarrassment, we can then go inward if we have skills, and we can say, "What do I need to do to change that?" or Oh, I don't think I'm going to say that again, or I don't think I'm going to do that again because it was it was too painful. But when it's coming from outside, the shaming issue, it kind of overwhelms that embarrassment dynamic and gets into a feeling of a lack of safety. And then you get defensive physiology. But Mm self-consciousness and embarrassment are very, very important to be nurtured because that's how we internally change our behavior. If mm-hmm. we're not shamed, if we're not, if it doesn't accelerate into this, you know, projective um, dynamic of a lot of transference of, of usually volatile anger um, and, and things like, yeah, the volatile emotions. But yeah. is it, it's interesting because as I'm hearing it as an outsider, it wasn't intended as shame, right? It was, it was something that had been a, a playful, fun uh, antidote that, that no longer... And that story no longer serves her son, but it wasn't. I, yeah. Yeah. Andrew, I, I would agree with you in that in this sense, because before he would kind of look at baby pictures and he would be like, look at me, because I mean, he did. He had like multiple little butt cheeks because his butt cheeks went into his thighs. And I mean, so, but I think the point was to recognize that, yeah, he's transitioning out of like, yeah. The, the little baby toddler. And that is a conversation that is coming up in our household because I'm also very excited to get rid of the, you know, step stools. Like it is kind of being known in the household that we are transitioning out of toddlerhood. Like I'm getting rid of certain toys and I was super excited to get rid of this last step stool in the bathroom. And so we are kind of recognizing um, this transition in life mainly maybe because I'm putting it out. But I want to come back to, um, while I did not kind of readdress this to about the, um, you know, my son no longer probably wanting to be identified as a fat, gorgeous baby, maybe something else. I did have to go and do a repair on something else. and, and, And it just showed value in repair. Like, also, my youngest is learning how to read, and we were trying to go through some reading material. It was the end of the day, long day of camp, and he was just, you know, messing words up left and right. And I honestly was losing my patience and, like, was, you know, kind of was like frustrated. And I'm like, why are you pronouncing S like F? And like, I was like, you know, that because the day before he read beautifully. And so, we went and then I was like, you know what? You're tired and you should just go to bed. But the way it went, all went down, it felt like I think my son was upset. I, he probably felt like he was being punished. And so he's being sent to bed. And, and of course he was tired. He fell asleep in a flash. And I'm sitting there like, oh, I feel terrible. I feel terrible. And so I go and I lay with him and just like trying to do that mirroring <laughs> neuron bonding. I'm like, just, I know you're sleeping, but feel that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he wakes up and he's like, you know, what's going on? And I was like, I'm sorry that I was short with you. 
So anyhow, I, we do this repair and, and it was just so sweet. He's like, it's okay, mommy. I, I'm, I, I was tired and you know, I, I'm going to, I do when I learn how to read and I'll try. So where we, we had a like coming together of like, I own that my actions were too much. Like I shouldn't have gotten that big and like reactionary with, you know, a kid that's just learning. <laughs> and he also understood that he needed to show up a little bit more. And, um, and so I do try to do that as much as I can with my kids, because I just think it's so important to recognize when we're wrong and not to, you know, you know, just do the simple steps. Like I was wrong. Mom, adults yeah. can be wrong. Kids yeah. can be wrong. We all aren't perfect, but where we can make it right is apologizing and coming to a sol- solution. And I see my kids doing that with the, with each other. I mean, they're, they're testing each other's boundaries left and right, but um, when one of them really, you know, pushes it too far, they'll back up and say, sorry. For me, consent's huge. Like if I hear a yeah. kid say no, no, and another kid isn't responding it, I'm all over that. So well, you, um, you felt embarrassed. And, and that's, that's the point. You felt embarrassed by the interaction and you did a repair. Totally. Totally. And, because And I have to, I want to say something now and it, it might, be triggering. Um, but I want to say what it, what's going on in middle America. And, and it has to do just basically with this conversation we've had to date. And I'm not going to name the city I was in where I was teaching in May. But I was in middle, I was in the middle of, 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 of America. And <clears throat> on the last day of class, I've got uh, 19 students, 17 women and, and two men, and approximately 15 members of the class were uh, morbidly obese or obese. Um, and on the last day of class, I, I, like I usually do, how's everybody doing? We got one more day. Um, are you getting your needs met? Um <clears throat> What can I help you with? What what's going on? Uh, what do you need? You know, for today, <clears throat> one woman raised her hand and she got she launched into a very cathartic dynamic. And the story was that the night before, uh, her twelve year old son sent a uh, note threatening suicide. And um, and so you know, I was doing some process with that. And I'd already heard the story from the another woman that w- that was helping, um, you know, get me at the airport, you know, about her child, her teenager, um, with dissociative identity disorder, um, and what that was like in the household uh, in the middle of the United States. And so we, I just, you know, really tried to to help her, um, and I asked her, well, what what was the threat, and. Um, she didn't read it out loud, but it was a text message. And I had the privilege of reading a text message of a 12-year-old threatening suicide. Um, and it was the most horrendous note of rage, hatred, and despair against the parents that I've ever read. And I was like, wow, this is powerful. And and so just as a as a therapeutic dynamic, I looked to the class because <clears throat> many of the class were parents. And I said, have any of you have children that have threatened suicide or, or gotten And half of them raised their hands? Half of them. So, it, it you know, it was a big wake up call that, you know, the underbelly of America and it's not just America, but it's the world. Um the, what's going on in the household is is not um, it's not right, and so it's beautiful having this conversation because you know we're trying to add some sanity so that we can allow our children to grow in an environment where they're not getting shamed, where you know, the, and they don't have to threaten suicide to get their needs met. I mean. I was just profoundly uh, yeah. disturbed on the way home from that yeah. and seeing what what was going on. And they were all, not all, most were obese. 
So we're, it's the weight issue again, which is a contributing or comorbid factor. You know, Michael, I, I grew up in New England, which is not middle America, but I, I think I've talked about this on the show before. I was suicidal as a teenager. Um, and I, and I actually think, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was just uh, two things. One, I was depressed partly because I was so heavy. And one is wanting attention in whatever sort of way. Like, I actually think it was more of a way of, I, I wasn't thinking it through because I was 12 or 13 years old. You don't have enough insight, even though, you know, I, I thought I did. Um, but really, my parents were wonderful. I uh, still are wonderful. Um, but for whatever reason, I and whether it was because I was getting shamed because I was fat or I was I don't know what that came from. Uh, but I I was uh, uh, I was, you know, looking I, I actually really think I, I, I what I ended up doing was taking a bunch of pills. And and I remember I was mad at my mom. I didn't want to go to school because I hated school. Um, and uh, and I remember I said, like, I hope you're happy now. But I, I really wasn't, I think, thinking that, oh, this might kill me, <laughs> even though <laughs> it was there. It was just like this thing of getting attention. But ultimately, like, you know, my parents loved me entirely. Uh but maybe that wasn't enough for some reason. I, I don't, you know, I, whatever reason it was, it, it was at that point. The 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 hindsight uh, of it is there's a few things. One is I think it makes me so good at what I do now, having sort of gone through that, especially working with kids who are uh, d- depressed or, or suicidal, or even adults who are, um, you know, suicidal, having sort of been through that. So that's a part of me that says, "Wow, what a blessing." But whenever I meet clients who are, t- you know, teenage, well, even if they're not suicidal, I have a client right now who's got a various developmental stuff and they're 13 years old. And I just, I have, I just come in with so much compassion for their parents. Um, and there's also a, a twist to that, that the parents who become so nervous because they want their kid to be healthy, their nervousness and their anxiety in themselves becomes a backlash feedback to the kid who's picking up on that nervousness and it becomes this sort of like going on. It's yeah. Thank you for that, Andrew, because I also, as a teenager was, was depressed. Um, I don't think I had suicidal ideation, but I would say that I wanted to die. And, and part of the depression was I just felt trapped Um, because I was raised Catholic in very rigorous Catholicism, and we were a block away from the church. And I hated church. I hated Catholic school. Um, I felt so boxed in. And and the reason I wasn't suicidal was that I went, you're out of here when you're a senior. You got three more years. Now I got two more years. Up, 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 one more year. And Bingo. When I graduated and got out, even though I went to a Catholic university, I never set foot in another church again for a while. But yeah, it's very, very difficult, you know, that we've come through these times, Andrew. I, I think that's that's the consciousness of our era and our time. You and I and, and Nikki, you know, we've we've managed to to navigate through those very difficult emotional states, and some kids don't. And the rates of suicide are up. The rates of depression are up. Uh, the rates of anxiety are up at all ages, uh, and not just the United States. Switzerland has the highest rate of adolescent suicide in all of Europe. And sure, sure. when I'm there, I hear about it every time from because I'm working with multiple Swiss students, and I hear about teenagers committing suicide on the train. So I'm my hats off to you, Nikki. Um, you know, just for the level of parenting and the willingness to repair, the willingness to not shame, you know, the, the, and just the awesome challenge of uh, being a parent. I don't have kids. Andrew, you don't have kids? Uh, not yet. We're planning uh, We're planning on, on that in the next year or so, but we're um, still working our cross-cultural issues out and okay. want to make sure that the kid grows up in a house that isn't entirely crazy. I mean, every house is a little crazy, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of crazy, I think, um, you know, we were talking about with, you know, with weight being a metabolic issue. And I also think there's what isn't spoken about so much is how to manage our hormonal shifts that we have in our lives. And, you know, for me, when I 
started my period and that the puberty, it just, I was actually, I don't know if I had shame around it, but I was quiet about it. I, I tried to do it secretly and I have a wonderful mom, a wonderful sister, but for some reason I didn't want anybody to know. And so I kind of had to sneak and get my, you know, my tampons and things like there was something that obviously I wanted to hide about it. So I don't really, that's just, I know that's part of my story, but, but what's been interesting is I am now transitioning into more of the menopause phase of my life. And I wouldn't have known it except for, for me, my tipping clue is I all of it. And I'm a pretty chill person. I developed rage. I was like fury, like, and, and, and I re- caught my attention is again, I was losing my shit over my kid who wasn't brushing his teeth. Right. <laughs> I mean, the little thing. And I got big with my hands and I was like, you know, I lived on the East coast for a little while and it suited me well. And so sometimes I can get pretty like loud and like just animated, but that animation, I think my, and I knew I did not feel like I was going to hit my kid, but I think my kid thought I was going to hit him because I got really big. My hands go up high and I'm like, you know, it kind of cornered him a little bit in the bathroom. And I was like, I was like, Oh my God. And like all of that, <laughs> all in a split moment, put my hands by my side. And I'm like, I am so sorry. This is way too big of an emotion over brushing your teeth. And I just, again, caught myself and got super apologetic and turned it on to me. But I was sharing this like because then it, like obviously it's really upset me. I'm sharing it with other um, women friends I have and some that are older and they're like, because I at first I didn't know that was menopausal something. And they're like, you're you're transitioning and not, you just got to check yourself and make sure that this isn't, you know, you know it's coming. And um, and so so that's uh, I have a whole new thing to, ch- to chat with my friends about because what's also interesting, especially with women who are having children later, like I'm kind of an older mom, and um, and some of them, the moms are having these conversations, like yeah, I'm going into my you know ending of my hormonal phase while my daughters are entering into it, and so there's this like interesting dynamic of you know, lighting up of hormones and then the dying off of hormones and how do these two people in the family, you know, manage it. And, and so I think again, coming back to conversation of like, and it feels crazy. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to have conversations with some men in my like life of like, what, what does hormones feel like for you? And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) So where, um, coming to the permission of there are going to be craziness in our lives and, and to own it and not try not to take it personally. Like, and I, so coming back to, again, coming back to some of these kids who are suicidal, there's probably a hormonal, you know, combustion happening and the media. And I say to my kids all the time, like, you know, they want to zone out on something. I'm cool with that. I like to zone out on some TV too. But when they're like watching the YouTube and like, just like 20 minutes, not even like clips and clips and clips, I'm like enough. And they're like, but it's funny. And they have the reasons. And I was like, listen, I just, the science is it's not good for your brain. And I didn't grow up with this. I'm trying to figure this out with you. Like, I get it. It's part of your world. This is how you watch TV or have viewing entertainment, but there needs, there's a balance and I don't know what the balance is, but for right now, I'm just, it's, it's a no and it's not a punishment, but it's just a no. (laughs) So, um, and they get it a little bit because, and it's, it's, it is scary because I see them when I, when I get, I'm like, all right, give them permission to watch the thing. They are excited. There is an endorphin rush. And, and this is kind of new a little bit um, of like, oh my God, they're like, like really excited about this. And I'm like, should they be like, is this okay? But it's also figuring out this is the way the world is. It's, I mean, it's not changing. 
Well, whether they, we like the way it or humans not, humans are. We we have emotions. You can't go through a day without an emotion. But the challenge is, you know, you let the emotions be overreactive, and 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 then you don't have the self control, the self resilience, the self regulatory capacity to to recognize that and to to ramp it down. I want to be one of your kids because I would want to have you as a parent. So I just want to say that how wonderful <laughs> you are. But I, I want to reference um, what you said about hormonal dynamics because um, as a man, well, first of all, this this was kind of funny. I remember a lecture um, on the testosterone cycle as a man. Apparently, testosterone in a man cycles seven times a day. And, and the, the, the teacher looked at us and said, you men are having seven periods a day. Women only have one a month. And it, it's kind of true. There's there's this level of irritation uh, that I have as a man that I kind of cycle in and out of. It doesn't take much for my wife to set me off. I mean, it could just be one word. It was, you know, but then I have to cycle down and I go, oh, there's my <clears throat> my second period of the day or my third period of the day. But the other dynamic with that is that interoceptive awareness is governed by hormonal regulation. When you feel hunger, it's governed by the hormone leptin. When you feel satisfied uh, in full, it's governed by the hormone ghrelin. When you are consciously aware, whether you're male or female, of your hunger, you are feeling your endocrine system. You're getting a conscious signal from your endocrine, from your hormones. And when you feel full, you're getting a conscious signal from your hormone. How wonderful that we have this interoceptive capacity to feel our hormones. And we we can then self-regulate around that. So that's a very, very important part around self-regulation um, and around the weight issue in general. So feeling yeah. that interoceptive awareness is, is crucial. And the it's a lot of it's based in, in what's <clears throat> now called contemplative neuroscience. And you know, to, to all the research has been done on meditation and yoga and qigong and tai chi, and it's you've got to reduce, as we've said, that exteroceptive sensing, <clears throat> the screen time, the the constant interpretation of what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, and just stop that mentation and build up the interoceptive awareness. And there's meta, there's challenges if, if you're obese and you have, you know, physical or metabolic issues uh, because those have to be worked with. And ultimately, it's about embodiment and just taking control of our body, taking control back, you know, and, and giving, you know, keep stop giving it away. Uh, and that's that takes a lot of work to, I, to turn inward. I want to uh, because you mentioned this earlier, too, and it's just the word it's. Is it taking control or it's taking alignment back with our body? It's really about getting um, getting back on track with it as opposed to uh, I've been doing some work with some neuroscience and cognitive sciences, and it's really getting that that not just the top down approach, but but having the top down and the bottom up, the body to the mind, the the inter uh, inter uh, enteric system coming up. And, and having them both be there, because I think for so much of us, it is, it, it becomes too much of the mind down and even the mind controlling the, the body up. Uh, and so just getting, getting in line with that. Um, and there, there was some other sort of point that was in there, Nikki, but my, my wife and I moved house about a week ago and my, my practice has been nonstop. So the fact that I've even made it this far without my brain shutting down is amazing. <laughs> um and it, it just it just did. It had something to do with the um oh yeah. So going just quickly along with that as like to really highlight what both of you are saying is when we catch ourselves in that, oh, I'm hormonal or I'm emotional or whatever, and I'm reacting out of that to actually step back and like I said, apologize or say, Hey, I'm I'm you know, um and like you said, Michael, like for me, my wife just has to look at me a certain way and I snap. Uh, and I have to kind of stop back and say, okay, I'm, there's just an insecurity or there's a hormonal thing in me. Because if we don't do that, what happens is we build the pattern on top of it yep. to to that. And then we don't get out of the cycle because we don't even see it anymore because it gets buried down. And so it is really, really important to, once we do notice that, even if it's a day later or a week later to say, hey, 
that that wasn't the right response that wasn't needed whatever that is i'm sorry i'm working to to, to go over that because that really helps to to break that and to allow us to um uh, to take control i don't love that phrase but yes to start to uh, to get back on track with the the, the natural rhythms i'll say um uh, you know the the word my wife likes to use because i kind of don't like the word control either you know all the connotations but she talks about sovereignty mm, you know, yeah mm-hmm. just the sovereignty of our body and you know in part of this conversation is just all the what happened during covid you know and in the the vaccination issues the boosting issues and it's like whose body is this you know um and and do i have uh, authority and sovereignty over my body to make choices over about what comes in and what goes out of my body so very very uh, important uh, conversation and i think up to now we've successfully avoided any conversation about diet and nutrition and food <laughs> well i think i mean well kind of to bridge the two uh the metabolic and the hormone is like being in relationship with it and 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 i like the word sovereignty like you know while i recognize that i might have more obvious hormonal mood fluctuations. I'm also making sure that I'm not shaming myself and constant, like I'll for sure apologize if I'm getting a little too much, but it's now on my calendar because to make sure I've been pretty regular. So I've never like had to like, you know, keep total track, but recently we have a family calendar for everybody to see and I put a little red mark and then like everybody because I will say it's there's gonna I'm entering in a phase where it's gonna be very normal but it's gonna be different. And so the family knows, you know, not to tiptoe around me and that <laughs> I get to be permission to be like, you know, an asshole. But but to recognize, because I'm also like, I'm in this place of like, this is, it might seem different, but this is me. This is a natural process that's happening to me. And I don't want to, I'm not apologetic about it. But I also recognize that like everybody, and I'm the only woman, even the dogs are boys. Like I am totally outnumbered. In my house. <laughs> 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 so I, and it's important to me that my kids, you know, I'm breaking the cycle and my husband does it sometimes of like, Oh, you're, you're, you can't think straight. You're you're hormonal, blah, 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 blah. And I'm breaking that narrative with my kids of this. Do not look at women or, you know, or once your friends, girlfriends, you know, start getting their period. And if they're bleeding through your pants, you can, you carry an extra shirt around and wrap it around their waist and take them to the nurse. Like, You're not going to like, you know, make fun of that person, shame or any of that. And um, because I think it's important to to break the narrative that women are crazy because they're hormonal. And um, and so I think it's just coming back to to coming back and to be in relationship or relationships around hormone relationship about our metabolic needs and. You know, one thing that has come up, like, you know, when we're talking about food and then when it's coming to an end and how people, you know, you guys had mentioned like, oh, it's coming to end. What am I going to do? And I think there's also a conversation of like, I've had a really great sandwich and I love sandwiches and I kind of get a little upset when it's about to be over. But I just like recognize oh, that was a really good sandwich. I really enjoyed eating that. And then I don't, I, it's not that I'm looking to go get another sandwich. So I just find it, it's like important to be in relationship with it all. And, um, and let's like take the shame out of it. Yeah. And, and learn how to bless our food and, and see how the kitchen is actually, you know, a source of compassion. Um, that's the way it is in, in Zen and Buddhist monasteries, you know, it's, it's, that's the, the hearth, you know, where we feed people, where we nurture people. And in these Eastern traditions, you know, the heart is always linked to the small intestine. Um, you know, that's, that's where the blood is built. And, and that's, that's where we get the energy and, and 
So um, these are, that's just a beautiful conversation. I so appreciate it. Um, yeah. Yeah. We always appreciate you, Michael. And, you know, if people want to, you know, we didn't talk so much about the food and all that, but, you know, you have a great book that does go more into it. So people can always read your books. I, I really loved your last book. And when you already started talking about it, you're working on another one, I got I got very excited. But we'll we'll link the the the, the biodynamics of uh, metabolism uh, in in this. And can I have not read that book? Um, so can just for any audience members who are curious but maybe might be not ready to purchase it in the fear that they're not they don't know about cranial sacral or that's not something they're in, they're more interested in reading about than the metabolic and the nutrition of ice how much of it is biodynamic in um talking about metabolism uh the book has five sections to it and um uh, i was i've been interviewed a number of times and i wrote the book just to, to save lives because of the the level of despair that's out there, not just emotionally and, and psychologically, but metabolically. The first section of the book um, is, is, is uh, my wife has is certified in biointernational uh, medicine in the, in the program of Dr. Rao's clinic in Switzerland. And she goes over the three principles um, of Mm, the three principles you need to have before you choose your diet. So I don't talk about diet. We talk about a little bit about diet in the book, but it's, it's knowing what the principles of metabolism that if you can embody, then you know how to choose, you know, what to eat. And in this podcast, we've talked about interoceptive awareness and, and having a, a contemplative practice that allows you to, to wake that up. The, the other premise in the book, Nikki, is that um, within the, all of this context that we're talking about, there's a, there's a spiritual dynamic here. There's a spiritual formation happening with the shaming, with the weight, with the emotional dynamics, with parenting. It's all a spiritual process. We're, we're at a point, you know, that every other the eastern cultures they've they've got mind body spirit integrated but in the western medicine we've 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 surgically removed the spirit you know from the 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 dynamic of health and from medicine and so i think it's very important uh because in the osteopathic community in the united states has has really worked hard to to bring that back in within a certain um, segment of their population so there's another um, whole uh, segment of the book about spirituality and different types of, of spirituality, because I've been trained as a multi-faith chaplain. So it's not about, you know, one religion being better than another. It's about trying to discover, you know, the sacred in, in your parenting style is a sacred parenting style. Um, so and we want to be able to wake that up and know how to wake that up in ourselves. So. So the spiritual formation, spiritual maturation, um, and seeing life more through that lens, like this whole conversation we just had could be filtered through a lens of, of spirituality, um, because it's designed to bring forth great compassion um, and to build empathy uh, and, and to realize that sometimes we're looking in the wrong direction and we have the capacity to look in the right direction when we get angry at our child to look inside of our heart and say, oh, that's not right. Let's do this repair. So that compassion is a natural, spontaneous activity um, that can arise. And when we have metabolic conditions, um, these, these emotions of empathy and compassion and kindness are very often suppressed and buried because the psychological problems are tremendously enhanced when you have uh, gut issues and gut problems. Well, well researched. So it talks about that issue. And it's only about the fifth section of the book where I get into the, all the hands-on stuff. So there's a lot, a lot of good information um, for anyone, even if you're not a manual therapist. And I, I have to say, although the publisher doesn't like me promoting it this way, but Amazon sells my book for $31. Come on, that's like, that's dirt cheap. So uh, I can't, I mean, I can't even sell it for that by the time I, I pay for the postage. So uh, I think it's well worthwhile. And I think especially that first section, because that's where I talk about my own autobiographical component with obesity and what, what generated Andrew and I having this conversation and getting on this podcast. So, 
Yeah, and having having read it, that's why I, I recommended it to that client I mentioned in the beginning. I think anyone can read it. And, and there might be some sections that maybe might be a, a little more technical or might not vibe if if you're not a a practitioner, but I don't I don't really think so. I think that it it it's it's good for a lot of people, you know, workers and just curiosity people. So I recommend it a lot. Thank you, Andrew. Thank yeah. you. Well, as always, we'd love to have more time, but you know, work and life and kids yeah. and all the, and all that. This is actually great that we can have time. I mean, we're we're trying to juggle a few other people, and it's just finding time right now is difficult with my work schedule, and Nikki's working kids schedule, and my travel schedule. So I'm I'm super happy that we were able to have this call before I I head out of the U.S. for a bit. So they just thanks for thanks for making time, and thanks for being you, Michael. Yeah, Andrew. Thank Absolutely. you. I always, always love our conversations. Thank I think you, we you. might we need a Michael show. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are. They're called the Michael books. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow, Nikki, yeah. thank you. Always good to see you, Andrew. Good to see you, and and we'll do this again sometime. You know, yeah. and my new book will be coming out in about a year or so. So we'll we'll have. I'm excited for that book. Interception is. I might have to message you if that's okay. I've. I'm I'm very into that topic as well, and um, so well, his bu- his book also it, it talks about it in the in, in the book that we're going to be plugging here. He does go into that a bit too, maybe not as in detail, probably, but it's 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 in there as well. So, and there's a there's an occupational therapist by the name of Kelly Maher, M A H E R, and she's um, a specialist in interoceptive awareness and in getting it, you know. Uh, into the population. So if you, you can go to her website, Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y and Mar, M-A-H-E-R, I believe. And if I've misspelled it, just send me a, send me a note, but it's time we build that interoceptive mm-hmm. awareness through contemplative practice and turning inward. Mm-hmm. Turning Absolutely. Inward. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a big part of just kind of sharing with what, with my work and it's, and it's interesting because I, some people are really into it, but I have people get up and walk a lot after I've worked on them and I'm asking prompting questions and some people are into it and some people find it super annoying. And I'm, I say to them, I'm like, I know I'm asking you, what does this feel? How does this feel? Where are you? And well, and it's not because I'm seeking validation of my work. It's because this is how you get to me asking these questions, get you to think about yourself from within. And when you, when we build that, I was like, it will get easier if you can Mm -hmm. trust the process and not Mm -hmm. get annoyed with me. And, um, (laughs) and sure enough, a lot of those that it it took a little while. And then again, I'm coming from a place of compassion. I was like, I understand it's hard. It's not something we're normally asked. Some people buy into it really easily and some people don't, it's, it's not, it's either or there, but and then sure enough, they're like, wow, I, I, I felt, you know, outside of their practice, they're like, oh, wow, I, I felt that. And I knew how to make changes. And I'm like, great. Cause this is the point of the work is you're not, that we're not attached to each other, that you will eventually get to a place where you can, you know, make your own postural self-corrections and not rely on a practitioner. And, um, so yeah, I'm constantly looking for more and more uh, information because that was I was while well, I had it internally, like I very much as a daydreamer, I'm very much in tune into my body. It was it took me a while to find the like how to language it and how to mm-hmm. cultivate yeah. that yeah. that. And it was not as much as I knew it in me. It took a long time for me to get better, and I know I still probably have room. In, to improve on how to take someone in a journey into their body, especially Mm -hmm. if that's not something they're easily capable of doing. Yep. Yeah. So big work, big work, big work of compassion. Thank you, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. All right. Everyone have a great day out there and uh, we'll talk next when we talk next. All right. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to us at touching into presence. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. You can find out more about Michael at www.shayhart.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast and subscribe to it through the platform of your choice. 
When you do this, it really helps other people find us, and we greatly appreciate your support. We look forward to hearing back from you and seeing you on our next conversation at Touching Into Presence. Bye for now.